Thanks to my colleagues Ash from pathology, Nicola from oncology and Marius from the surgical department for joining in. Uh, I think they are the best to talk about each individual findings. So what have we done? What we try to do um, from the radiology perspective in patients with neoadjuvant chemotherapy uh, with an extensive DCIS component. We always have the question if we have the best case scenario with the invasive disease showing complete response clinically, suspected on imaging, and maybe later in final pathology. What do the calcifications do when they are extending the size of the malignancy by more than 25% of the invasive component. And very often, um, if we see these patients, you can tell as a radiologist from the beginning, beginning that these calcifications will hardly go away. Uh, they might reduce, they might look a little bit different, but from a, from a radiology point of view, I will not be able to tell what these calcifications mean if the invasive component, which we easily see on ultrasound and mammography, actually mostly disappears. So that was our idea to look into a subset of patients. Those were, we know they had the best case scenario outcome with pathologic complete response to the invasive disease. And what did the calcification do? So we, were, we had a data set available of 960 patients and we had 246 of them showing pathology complete response on final pathology. And we went back and looked in those where we had a full set of mammograms and looked at the calcifications. Um, and we looked into local recurrence rate. So out of these uh, 246, we had 61 with extensive DCIS component with calcifications. And out of these 61, we had 19 with a full set of mammography. And we had 26 where we didn't have a full set of mammography. We had at least one mammogram available to confirm there is extensive DCIS. And we were able to track them later on uh, regarding their recurrent disease. So what we found uh, was interesting for those with mammograms, we couldn't predict um, that the calcification were indicative of response to treatment, whether the patient who had complete response to treatment of the invasive or the DCIS component, um, the calcification could still be there and she had, they had complete response. They could have reduced in size and some of them even disappeared. So from a radiology point of view, we cannot say if a patient had complete response to the invasive, the DCIS will do the same. But what we could see uh, out of these set 19 patients, uh, those with persistent DCIS, we had one local recurrent disease. And when we looked into the full, for those patients, we were able to track down later on, these 26 patients, we had four patients who had local recurrent disease, and all of them had persistent DCIS. So in a clinical setting, what we usually do when we want to do surgery, we would do um, a biopsy of the most distant calcifications. So I ask, knowing our results of that study, uh, Ash to go back and I ask him, Ash, is that an approach which is sensible to do? If we have persistent DCIS, where is the persistent DCIS in relation to the invasive disease? Before we start with microscopy and talk about DCS and calcification, I think it is important that we, I need to emphasize that how we handle the specimen because that is very important, how we look at the tumor bed and examine the tumor bed. Now, in all cases, the specimen has to be well fixed as we had it, and we examined the entire tumor bed. And it was extensively sampled, and we looked at the all part components of tumor bed to make sure that there is no residual viable cause, invasive carcinoma. And that was backed up by immunohistochemistry. Now, what we saw in our study that DCIS was limited to tumor bed. There was calcification in some cases which were going beyond tumor bed, but that calcification was benign. In, that was associated with sclerosing adenosis, hypoplasia, columnar cell change. But the calcification which was associated with DCIS remained in the tumor bed. And there was no extensive DCIS in terms of uh, 
having DCRs beyond beyond the extent of invasive cancer. Now, within that DCRs and calcification, we saw that DCRs had different types of response to chemotherapy. Now, a proportion of cases where there was hardly any response in the DCIS viable carcinoma cells in those ducts, and the calcification was associated with that viable DCIS, just like pretreatment or de novo DCIS with comedonecrosis and calcification. The second group of patients had calcification in the DCIS, but there was a questionable viability of cancer carcinoma cells in that DCIS. That means that DCIS was responding to chemotherapy and showed cells which were dying. And those dead cells or dying cells would be accumulated, their debris would be accumulated and calcified in the DCI. So the calcification remaining in those cell ducts, but the viability of DCIs was questionable. And the third group of patients or third stage of uh, response was that there was no DCIs left in those ducts. That means there is a burnt out DCIs, what we call it. That means the ducts were filled with calcified debris of the cell fragments, but no viable DCIs. That means that DCIs has responded to chemotherapy along with invasive carcinoma. In addition, there could be benign calcification within tumor bed, which, was which, is, which could be associated with benign changes because tumor is not one solid entity and it could be infiltrative. So some calcification was benign. And also sometimes invasive carcinoma, carcinoma cells, which are dead, and they are basically their fragments are lying in the stroma, would also be calcified. So sometimes a calcification can be associated with the dead invasive carcinoma and not with DCIS. So the calcification could be of various format. Thank you, Ash. That's very interesting. From a surgical point of view, um, Marius, can I call on you? So when we looked into those who had persistent DCIS and we saw a higher local recurrence rate, all of them had mastectomies. All of them had um, radiotherapy, apart from one patient, that was her choice. So we, we treated them extensively, but we didn't see, we still saw local recurrence to the chest wall and in one patient, even brain metastasis. Marius, do you think knowing these findings, you would do anything different? Again, we, we don't reach um, statistical significance in that um, study, um, but do you think you would do anything different in the future in terms of surgery? Yes. <clears throat> Thank you, Dania. This is a very interesting topic for surgeons because all the times when we see a lady in clinic and we start the surgical planning, it's always a matter of debate. What do we do? Do we remove the whole footprint of the disease that we had a diagnosis? Do we remove what we can see as the residual image abnormality, if there is any? And for the invasive component, many times this is easier because we can actually see more or less what appears to be a scarring. The problem is the microclassifications. That as you, as, you, as you said, and as demonstrated in the study, can extend and as uh, us uh, highlighted, may or may not represent invasive or um, residual uh, carcinoma in situ. So what we did for this cohort of patients was that we followed an individualized approach in general, targeting the distal microcalcifications, we biopsy them so that we get an idea and guide the, the extent of surgical dissection. Interestingly, as, as you uh, mentioned, all the ladies in this cohort who had their recurrence, they had a mastectomy. And this, in a way, poses an important question. Since we performed maximal maximum local treatment, including surgery in the form of a mastectomy, leaving no breast tissue behind, and also radiotherapy, and they still had the recurrence, was there something in particular in the biology of the tumor that led this recurrence? And if that's the case, then what was the benefit of performing a mastectomy to a woman with all the sequelae of a mastectomy, body shape, you know, um, sexual function, um, potential psychological burden, if we do not give them any, any significant benefit in terms of a long-term oncological outcomes. So somebody would argue, yes, you know, we have all these ladies, extensive microclassifications, remove the entire footprint of the disease, do a mastectomy, but are we, are, are, are we actually offering 
any benefit for these ladies? Do we need to have a more individualized approach and try to save the breast as, uh, as much as we can, if possible? So from the surgical point of view, I think these data demonstrate that everything is about individualized care, taking into um, consideration tumor biology, the characteristics of the disease, and tailoring the approach to suit the, uh, the every individual patient. Thank you, Mar Marius, that's helpful. Biology of the tumor, I think at the conference, in Gallen conference, there's a lot of talk of biology of the tumor. Um, and looking through our database um, to a radiologist, simple radiologist, I, I, I felt I couldn't really help my surgical colleagues with the uh, extensive calcified DCIS. Uh, after neoadjuvant chemotherapy, um, the findings that there is more lo local recurrence uh, happening is a little bit unsettling. Nicolo, do you think this is a altogether a very different disease we are dealing with? The majority of our patients were grade three. The majority had high grade DCIS, and despite having a maximal surgical treatment, we seem not to. In, in some cases, not to avoid local recurrent disease. Um, one of the patients died after three years. So um, long-term survival, we, again, low numbers, no statistical significance, but the tendency is a little bit there. So do you think this is a different disease we are dealing with? Thank you very much, Tanya. Um, yes, I mean, our analysis as you said, included 26 patients with residual uh, extensive in situ um, components, visible on imaging as microcalcs, in patients with a pathological incompletive response on neoadjuvant chemo. Um, despite the small number of patients included in our analysis, um, I think this may confirm that neoadjuvant chemo probably does not seem to have much impact on residual in situ uh, disease. However, the question to me is really, whether this really matters. Does this have any effect on risk of invasive disease recurrence and mortality? In our analysis, you said three patients developed a local regional recurrence, one patient developed um, a distant disease recurrence. Um, I do not think we can necessarily claim that uh, residual DCIS can correlate with, the, um, with these, with these uh, outcomes. However, um, as, as obviously it is, it is a bit difficult to ascertain whether these recurrences were related to the invasive disease component that might still relapse despite the presence of a pathological complete response, probably because, um, as you say, of a different tumor biology or to the inside to uh, disease component. And obviously, again, in the context of a small number, um, including in our analysis. However, I think it is very interesting to note that, um, again, in our study, uh, diagnosis, the majority of these patients, uh, 15, had uh, almost had a negative or to positive disease, and 73% had grade 3 invasive cancer. As you know, we have now um, various studies, such as, for example, CreateX and Catherine, documented better uh, disease-free survival outcomes of patients with triple receptor negative or R2 positive disease, receiving some form of a systemic treatment escalation, obviously uh, capecitabine, chemotherapy in CreateX and TDM1 in Catherine, in case of residual invasive disease upon completion of neoadjuvant systemic treatment. Nonetheless, I'm not sure our findings would necessarily have any implications on systemic treatment um, escalation options, and this would typically be uh, a population of patients uh, suitable for actually treatment de-escalation on the basis of uh, uh, the presence of a pathological complete response. And also in the context of the fact that these patients typically have received uh, a neoadjuvant course of anthracycline and taxin-based um, chemotherapy and for those with residual, with, with r positive disease, dual anti to antibodies. Although, also, I'm not entirely sure I would necessarily you know, expect uh, further systemic treatment to actually improve um, recurrence and survival outcomes in these specific settings. Uh, but on the other hand, I think, yes, um, these findings are certainly. Um, uh, a few implications regarding uh, the local regional management of these patients, especially in terms of uh, surgical options, uh, breast conservation, as mastectomy, radiotherapy regimen, surveillance, imaging. Um, so I think our analysis really raises important questions on the impact of uh, uh, DCIS on the risk of disease recurrence and how to how to 
we should best manage individually, um, as, as, as you have said, these patients. And I think these would really be very interesting questions to investigate and hopefully answer in larger prospective uh, studies. Thank you. Thank you. I think the takeaway home uh, message for all of us uh, from this very small subset of patients is we need more data. If that is a trend which is consistent with more data, then it would be worthwhile uh, thinking of what to do surgically, what we do oncologically, um, and from a diagnostic point of view and from pathology point of view, then it's very important <laughs> what we measure, where it sits, uh, when we measure things, when we look at things, calcification for pathology, how we cut specimen and so on. So I think we as a team probably go away with that and say, we, I think we need more data. We need to expand that. We need uh, to have more patients included and we need to conduct a prospective trial.